<clears throat> Hello again. Here's your uh, friendly weekly lecturer. Week four of the ministerial formation focus of the course. It's been quite a journey for me, and I hope for you. And thanks so much for your thoughtful questions and responses. I always so deeply value it when students take these kinds of opportunities and questions so seriously. This lecture uh, for the beginning of week four focuses our attention on what some consider to be the heart of spiritual formation. Uh, that is what we are sometimes call spiritual practices, sometimes spiritual disciplines. I favor spiritual practices, and you'll understand why by the time I'm through at this lecture. But first, I want to talk about something even more fundamental, really the heart of this whole course, a, a, an assumption or a conviction, a belief that uh, the whole idea of spiritual formation is based upon. And that is the person of the Holy Spirit, the one we often call the third person of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit in spiritual formation cannot be understated. I, I'm not sure it could be overstated. The Spirit was sent, was given, and is engaged to comfort, to instruct, to question, to clarify, to empower, to discern. In fact, discernment, that is the ability to judge well and to obtain spiritual guidance and understanding, uh, is the most important role of the Holy Spirit in the work of spiritual formation. In Christian theology, discernment is the province of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would continue to teach his disciples and that the Holy Spirit would help them to remember what he had taught them. In the Church of God, as stated in the We Believe uh, document, we believe that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, convicts us of sin, leads us to and incorporates us into Christ, and empowers us for Christian witness. As stated in an online publication from George Fox University, the Holy Spirit further, quote, requires both participation and intentionality. The focus of spiritual formation, they say, is the Holy Spirit who guides the ongoing journey towards union with God. The response is submission. There's that word again. Formation is an organic, lifelong, and holistic process led, perhaps directed, certainly guided by the Holy Spirit involving right thinking, right behaviors, and right feelings of the individuals and communities committed to the process. Today's lecture is rooted in this teaching, especially in these key words, participation, intentionality, discernment, right behaviors, right thinking, and submission. Spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines are at the heart of spiritual formation, especially when we qualify that by saying intentional spiritual formation. But before I get to a fuller discussion of what those terms mean, I want to review in this context some of those key words because they take on an especially important perspective in the context we're now entering. Formation goes on all the time, right? When we know it, that is, we're aware of it, we're being intentional with it, and when we don't, that is, when we are not consciously aware that it's going on. 
spiritual formation can be accidental and it can be intentional. Growing up in human development, our formation is more often than not accidental. By that, I mean, for example, my parents were engaged in helping me to grow up to be a good Christian person by helping me to be a good boy. While some of that was intentional, they said things like, this is not the way we behave. We don't talk like that. We don't do those things. I remember one time my father said in response to a question about why, he said, because you're a Kelly. I don't know what that means, but it meant something to him. It's also part of how we say, how we celebrate, right? This is how we celebrate Christmas or New Year's or Halloween and Easter, for example. I grew up going to New Year's Eve watch night services. We were in church on New Year's Eve. We weren't out partying like the rest of the world. And equally important, this is not how we celebrate. Sometimes that formation was strongly intentional from my parents to keep me from unacceptable behavior. For example, when I had my mouth washed out with soap because I said a bad word. Sometimes that formation was strongly intentional to teach me good behavior. For example, when I was taken to the library and encouraged to read good, that is, appropriate books, and when I was encouraged about my studies and attendance at school. But more often, it was accidental. Some have suggested that the definition for accidental formation is formation by osmosis. I observed the way they talked and the way they treated other people. I heard the language they used in describing others. They took me to a particular church of a particular denomination without ever explaining to me why this one and not another. They took me to church every single time the doors were open and thereby taught me something important about the scriptural injunction to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. I would say that I learned the Bible before I could read because it was formational in my parents' life together. We never practiced family Bible time. I seem to remember there were a few attempts, but they were just attempts. I, but I was aware about my parents and how religious they were about their own Bible time together. Something I was very aware of as I lay in bed in the morning, listening to them every single morning except Sunday because we we're going to church read the Bible, and pray aloud, often praying for me. Yeah, on purpose, down the hall. I, I do want to say that it was not always healthy. Bias, prejudice, racism, and the role of women in the church were caught, sometimes taught, while living with my parents and attending my church of origin. What my parents were doing with intentionality and serious participation was engaging in spiritual practice for themselves and their own formation, and by extension, my formation. They were, to note another word in our definition, submitting to a process that was actively promoted and taught from the pulpit of the church we attended. Right practices designed to form us as good Christians. I'm sure many of you could tell stories like mine. So then, what are these spiritual practices? I think spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines are terms that mean pretty much the same. I prefer practices because it more clearly speaks to the necessity of intentionality, 
of continuity, of commitment, and ongoing regular engagement, and doesn't carry quite the negative vibe that discipline does when applying it to faithful behavior. Marjorie Thompson in Soul Force points out that, quote, all is grace, yet all depends on our willingness to work freely with grace, noting again the role of agency. Spiritual growth, she says, is essentially a work of divine grace with cooperation. But experience teaches that we don't cooperate with God's intentions for us easily. Think about the Garden of Eden. Opening ourselves to the work of the Spirit requires intentional effort and discipline. This leads us to her definition, one with which I agree, that spiritual disciplines are practices that help us consciously to develop the spiritual dimensions of our lives. I think the whole of our lives. If we go back to the George Fox definition of spiritual formation, I might change Thompson's last sentence as follows. Spiritual disciplines are practices that help us consciously to develop the totality of our humanity so that we grow into the fullness of Christ Jesus, as we are invited to in Colossians 2. To fully understand the meaning of spiritual practice, we have only to look at other fields of endeavor. Doctors practice medicine. Athletes practice their sports. Attorneys practice law. No one, or at least no good one of these, stops learning, stops doing, stops seeking greater understanding and skill. They work at their profession regularly, consistently, and with discipline. Really, that's true of nearly every kind of work. This is why these terms are so interchangeable. Discipline requires practice. Practice is how one maintains discipline. Spiritual practices are both personal and communal. By that I mean the spiritual practices conform us to the work and will of God in the world. That is, they create the basis on which and by which we witness beyond our words in our work in the world. But they are more than personal, as Dykstra and Bass say in a theological understanding of Christian practices. Quote, by Christian practices, we mean things Christian people do together over time to address fundamental human needs in response to and in the light of God's active presence for the life of the world. In other words, we engage in Christian practice to assist God in achieving God's purposes for humanity, which assumes that the world the whole world and all that is in it is created and sustained by a just and merciful God who is now in the midst of reconciling this world through Christ. By the way, I've also included a link to a video uh, with Dallas Willard talking about spiritual practice. This is not a required viewing, but you might find it worthy of your time and helpful in the project that I'm going to soon be talking about. We will be talking right now, we're really talking about personal formation, both you as a follower of Jesus and you as a pastor or leader in the life of a congregation. We will also, by the end of the course, be talking about the role of practices in the life of the people of God, a congregation, for example. So finally, uh, what are spiritual practices and how do they work? Historically, the list of practices is long, but as Dykstra and Bass point out, Christian spiritual practices meet certain definitional criteria. These are helpful to us in understanding what constitutes a practice and how that practice might be lived out. Practices, by the way, are never theoretical. 
but are always lived. Just as my parents read the Bible and prayed each morning except Sundays, when those practices became part of our communal worship, Dijkstra and Bass give these uh, definitional criteria that are worthy of our attention. First, Christian practices address fundamental human needs and conditions. They are about living in the world, living well in the world in light of the human condition out of our own agency under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Christian practices, thus, in number two, involve a profound awareness, a deep knowing. They are imbued with the knowledge of God and creation. These practices didn't just come out of somebody's head. These are practices that are witnessed to in Scripture. Third, Christian practices are social and historical. They are activities that people engage in together over time and which Christians have been engaged with, well, since Jesus. And finally, Christian practices share in the mysterious dynamic of fall and redemption, sin and grace. Marjorie Thompson provides a good working list of practices. She identifies eight of them in her book, Soul Force, An Introduction to the Christian Spiritual Life. You can find other lists on Canvas, and you can, as I've said before, uh, Google spiritual practices, and they'll come up with, you'll produce a huge number of them. Pay attention to those that you look at and, and weigh them against these four criteria that Dijkstra and Bass identify. So here are um, the eight that Marjorie Thompson identifies. Spiritual reading, which she defines as a meditative approach to the written word. Not just reading the word, but spending time with understanding. Number two, prayer, which expresses whatever else is going on, our relationship to God. Three, common worship. Worship is the work of all the faithful who gather to praise, honor, and glorify God. Four, fasting, to give up anything that comes between ourselves and God. I know often we think of fasting in terms of diet, but fasting is not a diet principle only, or it might be for some of us, but it's um, anything that comes between ourselves and God. So, one can fast his cell phone. One can fast his laptop. One can fast. Well, you get the point. Five, self-examination, confession, and awareness. The whole point, uh, Thompson says, is to become more God-centered by observing and confessing the moments when we are not so God-centered. Number six, spiritual direction a deeply personal pattern of relationship of a teacher and learner in an area of practicing the spiritual life. That teacher might be a mentor, might be a spiritual director, might be a friend or a pastor, or it might be the Holy Spirit. And the learner is always you, me, us. Seven, hospitality. Uh, we'll say more about this probably, but welcomed as Christ, this emerges out of a deep conviction from the Benedictines in ancient Roman Catholicism that any stranger who approached the monastery would be welcomed as if that stranger were Christ. And eight, finally, a rule of life. The purpose of a rule is to help us grow into holiness in a lifelong process of personal transformation. We're going to do kind of a rule of life later on. We'll talk about that. So it's probably a practice you don't want to engage in right now because it will require a lot more instruction and direction, uh, especially as it connects to this course and formation. As I indicated, there's no comprehensive authoritative list of Christian approved Christian spiritual practices. But Marjorie Thompson's list and the other one listed on Canvas come pretty close to being exhaustive. 
So what does this have to do with you? What do you need to do about this or with this? It's fairly simple and finally, of course, not so simple to get inside the idea of spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines, it's necessary to try one on, so to speak. Discipline is a key element of disciple, which is a key element of our developing relationship with a teacher. In this case, of course, the teacher we speak of is Rabbi Jesus. To follow him we must discipline ourselves to follow those practices that are designed to bring us more fully into relationship with our master. Your assignment then for the next several weeks is to first choose one of the practices on Thompson's list or other lists that you find. Second, to do some research, read up on that practice to have a better understanding of what you might be committing yourself to. Then develop and implement a plan for practicing this over the next weeks and record your decisions and reflections and submit them according to the instructions posted on Canvas. There's more detail about this assignment on a special sheet posted on Canvas, and you'll want to look at that for sure. But please, when you begin this project, and I hope you will begin it right away this week, please send me an email that tells me what practice you've chosen and how you think you might implement it. This is not set in stone. Uh, it may change. You could discern and through the process of one practice that you really should be focused on another. That's okay, except be all up front and open about that and confess it, so to speak, in terms that make sense in this practice that we're talking about. Your reflection on this journey should be posted during the week of October 22nd. I look forward to reading about this part of your journey. And as I've said every time, if you have any questions, more specific questions, you have my phone number and you have my email address, please feel free to seek clarification if it's needed. God bless you on your journey.